Good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Marty. I'm with the MSCI, and I want to welcome you all to today's Optimum Safety Management and MSCI Safety Webinar, webinar titled Safety Leadership. There's a couple of items that we need to cover right up front. Um, number one, you are all as attendees on mute, and the reason we do that is to stop all of the background noise that would otherwise interfere with today's webinar. Second thing I wanted to talk about is how to submit questions during the webinar. In the GoToWebinar interface, there is a Q&A box. If you open that box, you can use the drop-down menu in two to select the meeting organizer, to which you can then send questions. And we will accumulate those questions as our presenter goes through his presentation, and then we'll do a Q&A session for the last 15 minutes of the webinar. So please put your questions into the question interface. Also want to remind you that there are some resources that you can download even during today's webinar. If you go to the handout segment of the GoToWebinar interface, you'll see that there are five handouts that you can download, which includes a copy uh, of all the slides that our presenter is going to show today. So please remember to do that. And if you have any questions after the webinar, you can always submit them to the email address you see on the screen there, safetyhelpline at optimum-usa.com. And with that, I'm going to introduce today's speaker, Steve Yates. Steve has been doing these webinars with us for almost two years now. In fact, it may be two years. Uh, Steve is really a great partner of MSCI. Steve is on our safety committee which we've now renamed Health and Safety Committee. Steve is the founder and president of Optimum Safety Management. He has a mechanical engineering background and he's recognized for the development and implementation of effective safety management systems now within many of our um, membership companies. He's also an authorized OSHA outreach trainer and a certified leadership coach. So Steve, uh, thank you for doing these free webinars for us and our members. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to you to start your presentation. Hey, Chris, thanks so much for the introduction and for setting this all up for us today. It, uh, it's a great privilege to uh, be allowed uh, the uh, privilege of uh, presenting these materials in each of these quarterly webinars. And, and I would tell you that uh, as you and I have talked, you know, each, each one of these, I say, well, <clears throat> you know, this is my favorite topic before I present it. But uh, this, without a doubt, uh, is one that's near and dear to my heart. And I'm excited to uh, bring this topic to the membership today because I think it could really lead to some transformational change across the uh, association and across the members' organization. So uh, with that, I wanna just uh, cover a rough outline of where we're gonna head today. So I, I'm gonna dive in and talk about the purpose of the webinar. Uh, I wanna make sure that we all really understand the perspective I'm trying to bring today and, and what we're trying to accomplish as we go through today's webinar. Now uh, we're gonna talk about leadership defined we're going to talk about how it begins with us, and then uh, I want to I want to help the uh, members and the attendees that are on the webinar today understand how to cast a vision for safety leadership that can be very effective. And um, <clears throat> we'll talk about some of the pitfalls of of what happens when we don't do that well. Now, I want to talk about investing, <clears throat> maybe in a new voice. As you can hear, I've got a little bit of a frog in my throat this morning. We'll try and work through that. <clears throat> But I, I do want to talk about investing in other leaders. Uh, there's a tremendous value and, and uh, exponential growth that's gained when we do that. And then also want to talk about uh, some other considerations, because I can't possibly cover everything there is to talk about on safety leadership in a one-hour webinar. And I um, want to also present some resources that are available. And then the goal is to finish uh, the webinar presentation right about quarter to 12 and head into a uh, question and answer time. And I know you've teed the audience up with a request to uh, bring some questions on difficult leadership situations that we can um, banter back and forward and kind of talk about some potential solutions. So uh, with all of that in mind, uh, I'm going to go ahead and dive right in to our discussion today and begin to talk about the purpose of the webinar. You know, as I've uh, prepared this webinar for today and, and been thinking about this topic over the last uh, three years that Optimum has been a member of MSCI and we've interacted with members at uh, 
different conferences and product specialty conferences. I've talked to uh, sales reps and <clears throat> purchasing agents and human resources reps and CEOs, kind of all across the spectrum, uh, safety uh, managers and directors and so on. And um, one of the common things that we find is uh, there is a leadership vacuum. And I think that extends not only throughout MSCI membership companies, but also throughout our American culture here in the US, uh, within Mexico and Canada as well. There's just a real vacuum uh, when it comes to this real valuable resource that is in such short supply. Um, it literally can be like oxygen to an organization where without it, uh, the organization can starve and die. But organizations that have great leadership really can thrive. And um, one of the resources that we're going to be talking about today, John Maxwell, who's a leadership uh, guru, um, uh, speaks often about everything rises and falls on leadership. And that's really the, the goal of what I want to try and get across today. Um, mainly what I'm hoping to do is to incite a movement today. Uh, I really want to inspire and incite a movement across the safety community for MSCI and those that might be listening that are in upper management, um, I, I want to incite a leadership development movement. If everything rises and falls on leadership, if we spend some time in this topic, speaking about it, working on it, developing leaders within our organization and within the association, together, this group that's on this webinar today can literally transform our industry. And that sounds like a lofty goal, uh, but I would tell you that a group of 80 to 100 people that would begin to have this conversation and work it into our organizations can achieve the goal of transforming our industry. It's really an amazing uh, ripple effect throughout the industry. So with that said, uh, the webinar today that I'm presenting is based largely on the works of John Maxwell. Now, some of you may know John, some of you may have heard of him. Um, John is a prolific author on the topic of leadership and management, uh, mainly on leadership topics. Um, he's been given a number of different, ac different accolades. Uh, he's listed as number one on Inc. Magazine's list of top 50 leadership and management experts. Uh, he's really a very well-respected authority in this topic. One of the reasons I love John's materials is that they're very easily understood they're broken down into bite-sized pieces that someone as simple as me can grab and really understand. And then, you know, if you want to be an expert on anything, what you do is you begin to study it and then teach it. And much like those that are on the line, you're in the position where you could actually grab these materials, study them, begin to teach them in your organizations and watch them be transformed. So just a little bit about the materials and the background here. We are going to have a pretty extensive discussion on safety leadership, but then I also want to provide you with some practical tools that you can take into your own organization and leverage to begin these discussions within your own teams. And we'll talk about a plan for execution. So as you can tell, I'm a little bit excited about this. I want to go ahead and dive right into it. And we're going to talk about leadership defined. When we uh, unpack John's 21 laws of leadership, his law number two really applies here. It's the law of influence. What John tells us is the true measure of leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. You know, in, in our culture today, we have a lot of self-proclaimed leaders, but what we find with those leaders is that nobody's following them. They're really not a leader. One, one of the uh, jokes that John makes in one of his books is that a self-proclaimed leader who's going somewhere and has no followers is really just taking a walk. Uh, he's really not leading anyone. And, you know, you can think about this when you walk into a room. Maybe you've walked into a boardroom with a lot of people in the room. There might be a president or a CEO seated at the head of the table. There might be managers that work for him around the room and uh, different people at different levels of the organization. And if I asked you how you identify the leader in the room, you've seen this at play. And what happens is somebody at that table begins to talk and share thoughts and share insights 
and everybody in the room leans into the conversation. And then you'll watch maybe that leader at the head of the table begin to talk and everybody kind of disengages. And then that one person speaks up again and you'll see the influence in the room centered around one or two key people in the room. That's leadership. That really is what defines leadership. It's literally the influence to be able to get people to lean into a conversation, understand where you're headed and want to hear more about where it is that you're heading. John talks about this in his book, The Five Levels of Leadership. We see starting at the bottom of the list, positional leadership. And we work through the leadership all the way up to pinnacle, different levels of leadership. And as I describe these, you'll be seeing different people coming to mind and different uh, interactions you've had or different uh, scenarios you've seen play out within your workplace. Positional leadership, it's based on rights. Uh, people follow you because they have to. We see this a lot of times with young, inexperienced leaders who are given a position maybe too early. Uh, they have to lean on the right that they're given to lead. They have to lean on the position and that people have to follow them, so therefore get in line. Um, you see this also with leaders who have risen up through an organization too quickly They've really not developed their own leadership ability and they're following. And now they try to assert their position over people. And it's a place where a lot of abuse happens within leadership. We rise to the next level in permission. That's based on relationship. People follow you because they want to. You've built some relationship with people. You've gotten to know them. They've seen you have some levels of success and they respect your opinions and now they follow you because they want to. Then we get into a production. It's a results-based leadership. People follow because what you've done for the organization are actually able to see the things that have happened because of what you've done and they now want to get more of that and want to be around you so that they can learn and grow and be part of actually moving something forward. The next or fourth level of leadership, this is where things really start to blossom for a leader. They're in the people development mode or reproduction mode. And people are following because what you've done for them. You've actually helped, you've poured into them. Um, you've actually brought them along and helped them become part of the leadership movement in your organization. And now they're following you because of what you've done. They, they literally follow you into a battle uh, because of the fact that you've poured into them. Pinnacle leadership is really what we all should be aspiring to attain to. And that's respect level of leadership. People follow you because of who you are and who you represent, what you represent. And it's a, it's a level of leadership that very few leaders attain, but yet it's one that we should aspire to and that we should be working towards. Now, I need to address the elephant in the room uh, because there's a lot of different types of leaders on this webinar. We have, uh, I would imagine, CEOs on this webinar. We have owners of service centers. We have directors of safety, production uh, leaders. We have management leaders. Uh, we have people that are on a uh, operations side or maybe on a purchasing side, lots of different types of people. And we'll all be at different levels of that leadership on that spectrum. You also work for leaders who are on that spectrum. Uh, it doesn't matter where they are, they're somewhere in one of those five categories. Now, one of the toughest positions is if you find yourself in a spot where your level of leadership is higher than your leaders. This requires an extreme amount of patience, an extreme amount of care to lead from that position. John addresses this in that book, and I'd recommend it if you are in that kind of a situation he talks about the process of leading from below. And it's a difficult one. You cannot bow down to uh, a thought that you don't need to lead from that position. You still need to lead if you're in that spot. You can't just acquiesce uh, to uh, poor decisions or poor uh, direction. You need to be able to set better direction. Uh, you've heard people say maybe I'd rather uh, ask for forgiveness than beg for permission. Uh, that's the type of leadership that you need to be exuding when you're in that type of a position. But again, it's a little bit of a sticky wicket 
and you've got to be careful how you're doing it. I uh, would love to have discussions with you if you're in that spot. They're actually some of the, the more rewarding positions to lead from when you can get it figured out because you can have a tremendous impact on the organization. All right, leadership begins with us. So if we're going to start anywhere, it's got to be with us. John describes in the law of the lid, law number one, that we must continue developing ourselves. If we're not going to do that, our leadership can our leadership level can actually become a lid for the organization or a lid for our department or the section of the organization that we're that we're leading. Now I want to show you a short video here. It's actually a, 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 P, a PlayStation 2 commercial that was done. I have no idea what the video has to do with PlayStation, um, but uh, it's a great video. I'm going to show you this and we'll discuss it uh, here in just a moment. Training fleas requires a glass jar with a lid. The fleas are placed inside the jar and the lid is then sealed. They are left undisturbed for three days. Then, when the jar is opened, the fleas will not jump out. In fact, the fleas will never jump higher than the level set by the lid. Their behavior is now set for the rest of their lives. And when these fleas reproduce, their offspring will automatically follow their example. So I want to, um, I want to just have a, a discussion with you about uh, this video. The fleas. Um, and I'd like to try and get that off the screen. Okay, there we go. So I want to have a discussion with you about the video. If you caught it uh, in the narrator's description, those fleas are placed in the jar, <clears throat> the lid's placed on top, and the fleas bounce up and down until they sense where the lid is. And then as the lid is removed and even the jar is removed, the fleas have found the boundary that they can go to without striking the jar and they replicate those movements and never go beyond them. From a leadership standpoint for humans, we do the same exact thing. It's self-imposed limits on our own growth or self-imposed limits on what we believe we're worthy of attaining or what we can attain. And it's a limit that needs to be blown apart for yourself. You have to realize at some point that that limit is self-imposed and you can actually remove it. The biggest problem and what we see so often in different cultures is that with this self-imposed limit or lid, if you caught what the narrator said towards the end of the video, their offspring reproduce the exact same patterns. What that means is that generations and generations of those fleas will not go beyond the limit of that jar that no longer even exists. And I can tell you, you you've seen it you watch it on the news, there's parts of our cultures that have those self-imposed lids that never remove them themselves. We have to speak into that for one another. Uh, I'm trying to speak in that, into that for you today. If you are in a situation where you don't believe you can attain more than you are doing currently, I just wanna like help you pull that lid off and sense that there's a whole lot more outside of the limits that you've set for yourself. And I want to provide some resources for you today that you can actually begin to grow beyond that. So you've got to raise your lid. That's the message here, right? When we talk about that, in John's book, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, he has an appendix that's a great resource for self-evaluation. You can walk through that within about a 15 or 20 minute period and actually grade yourself in each of the 21 laws even before you read them, I'd recommend you do it before you read the book if you haven't done it. It's a great reassessment every so often. Uh, but what it'll do is it'll give you targeted points to study in leadership and learn so that you can raise your own lid. We want to remember that when we talk about leadership beginning with us, people first buy into the leader and then they buy into the vision. They're going to follow you because of you and who you are to them, and then they'll want to hear about your vision. So what we really need to do is we need to make sure that we're, 
worth following. You know, often we say, hey, people won't follow what I'm trying to teach them and they won't follow what we're doing or what we're trying to lay out as initiatives. The, the reality is that the solution might stand right in the mirror for you, uh, just like it has with me with different situations I've been in. Uh, we need to work on ourselves. We need to be worth following before people will. John's law number three, the law of process, describes that leaders develop daily and not in a day. It is a daily discipline. And this is kind of an interesting set of words that he uses here. But as you follow through the progression of this, you see that we start out in a position maybe where you are today. You know, I don't know what I don't know. I, I've not talked about um, this topic of leadership. Uh, I've not um, engaged in conversations about it. So I really don't even know what I don't know. My hope is I'm blowing that one apart for you today and kind of exposing to you that there are some things that you don't know and here what, here's what they are. Um, the second stage is as you begin to engage the discussions and the study, you begin to know that you need to know more and then you actually begin to know what you don't know. You, you begin to learn what your gaps are. And that's a lot of that assessment. If you engage that, you'll jump right into that third level pretty quickly. Next step, as you study it and you begin to engage discussions and engage in the process, you'll know and you'll grow and people will actually start to see it. Now, I, I hesitate to say this because you might be on this webinar with your employer, but as you engage in leadership study and growth, you become a more valuable employee, not only to that organization, but to others. And you begin to become more valuable as a human being at providing services to an organization. This is a great way to differentiate yourself from other candidates. Now, I've, I've hired people within my organization simply based upon the fact that they've been involved in leadership growth and study. They didn't have all the skill set that they needed to do their job when they started. I was willing to invest in them because it was showing that they had leadership ability. The next stage, the last stage where you really want to be is I simply go because of what I know. You've learned it, you've studied it, you've really engaged in it, and now you're able to lead and you'll be able to lead in situations that you're dropped into at, the, at a moment's notice and not feel like a fish out of water like many of us do. Law number 11, really important here. Law number 11 is the law of the inner circle. As we're talking about leadership beginning with us, we really want to understand that no one has everything they need in themselves to build great organizations, right? A leader's potential is determined by those closest to them. Andrew Carnegie knew this when he started U.S. Steel. He surrounded himself with so many different leaders from different disciplines and facets so that in and of themselves, the whole group, they had everything they needed. If he found a deficiency, he went and brought somebody else in. His inner circle was so strong. We need to really be strategic in that selection. The other thing we need to realize is that the leader finds greatness in the group and then helps the members find that same greatness in themselves. So surround yourself with people that have what they need in order to help the organization succeed. And then you continue to pull that greatness out of them. You know, we had a bit of an aha moment with our safety committee meeting last week. The MSCI safety committee meets on a regular basis and we do things like building the agendas for the next safety conference. That's one of the main tasks of that group. We have the safety conference coming up here in September and a lot of our discussions around the table were about how kind of a self-critical analysis of last year and what we could do to really tune and make this year's conference a lot better. So as we were in the midst of that engaged, uh, engaged in that uh, discussion, we had a, a kind of an aha moment when all of a sudden we realized, hey, this conference is not for the people sitting at that table. We're really building that conference for the rest of the industry to come and learn from the leaders in the industry. A lot of them are sitting in that room. So what I wanna make sure that you're aware of is the safety conference that's coming up. You know, when we talk about the, law, the leadership beginning with us and then building an inner circle for ourselves, 
where we surround ourselves with people who know what we need to know, there is no better place than the MSCI Safety Conference when it comes to safety leadership. The, the safety committee has developed this and will be teaching this. So you have industry leading safety professionals that are gonna be there. We're also co-locating it with the National Safety, Con uh, National safety Council's Expo and Congress. So if you really wanna spend the full week there, you can come earlier in the week for the Congress. You can come the morning that our conference starts and go to the Expo and really see a lot of what's new in the industry and then stay for a day and a half of topics taught by all of your industry leading experts. So my question to you right now is, are you coming? September 27th and 28th in Indianapolis, great central location, easy to get into, easy to get out of. Uh, I, I cannot tell you uh, stronger the value of this conference for raising the lid on your own safety leadership. If you have safety as a title, if you lead safety professionals, if you have safety professionals that report to you, get them to this conference. It is the best place for MSCI members to learn. And then what I also wanna make sure is that you're aware of the partnership that MSCI has with the National Safety Council. There's things like the MSCI Safety Excellence Program. And then there's many of the industry safety professionals who are coming over from operations roles or other roles within your organization, if you're new to safety, you must get through the Advanced Safety Certificate Program. I moved into the safety arena from an operations management role about 20 years ago. As a young engineer, mechanical engineer working in a plant, uh, got inspected by OSHA, the owner asked me to step into a safety role. I didn't know how to tie my shoes from a safety standpoint could barely spell the word. But as I got started, I knew early on I needed to get involved with people who did know. And I engaged the National Safety Council and actually earned my advanced safety certificate. It has served me well over the last 20 years. It was tremendously worth the investment. And I would just tell you again, if you're not doing that yet, why not? You really need to be involved. Okay, moving on from leadership beginning with us, I wanna talk about casting a vision now. How do we cast a vision that gets people to follow and helps them know where we're headed? This is wrapped up in John's law number four, the law of navigation. So, so we want people to follow us. The question is, do we, do we as the leaders know where we're going? Because as the leader, you chart the course, right? You, you can give the rudder to anybody, but a leader has to chart the course on what the destination looks like and how we're gonna get there. So some things to consider as you're charting that course. What is the vision of the future state that you're looking to achieve? And then within your individual organization, every organization have, has its own culture, it has its own history. You need to reflect on the past. Where have you been? What have been the obstacles in the past? What are the things you're gonna to need to work around or work through in order to get to where you're going. And then you also need to understand that not everything you plan will succeed. You know, plans are just that, right? So it, we've heard said, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. We, we need to have a plan in place so that we have a direction and we know where we're going, but plans get adjusted and not everything you, you plan will succeed. So be willing to fail forward but what I will tell you is you have to make sure two things. Number one, don't change your plan dramatically every month or every two or three months, changing and charting a different course. That just gets people seasick. You really need to make sure that you have a consistent plan. And you also need to make sure that you don't allow good to be held hostage to perfect. Now, what do I mean by that? Don't wait to execute your plans until every I is dotted and every T is crossed, you know, analysis paralysis, right? We wanna make sure that we get the plan good, we get out and we get it moving and let's adjust as we go. You can't see everything you need to see from the port. So you can't plan the entire trip. You've gotta get out on the ocean and see where the winds are gonna take you and then keep adjusting as you go. Hopefully that analogy makes sense. Uh, the other thing that we've got to do is we've got to get a compelling vision. 
you know, I've been around organizations that, you know, they, they just cannot set a compelling vision to save their lives. And we really need to get back in the boardroom and, and get a compelling vision. You know, if, you're, if your compelling vision is to be at the industry average for metal service centers or mills, your compelling vision is to have an OSHA recordable rate that's 5.1 or 5.2. That's not all that compelling to me. I, I think about that and sometimes it makes me sick because I think 5.1 means that we're gonna injure 5.1 people out of every 100 who walk into our workplace this year at a level significant enough that OSHA wants to know about it. Prescription medication, sutures, all the way up to bones broken, fatal workplace injuries, that type of thing. Now, I don't want to work in a workplace like that. I certainly would never want my son or daughter to go to work in a workplace like that. You know, if you have a workplace that has 600 employees, that means that over 30 of them are going to get injured this year at that kind of a level. That's unacceptable. So if your goal or your compelling vision, your casting of a vision is the bls.gov data, you need to rework that. You've gotta learn to take people on a journey with you to a better place, and, and you really need to be driving at something that's better than the industry average. So, you know, driving to zero, right? We have discussions about this. Is it possible? Is it something that we can achieve? The reality is yes. Now, we have workplaces, uh, one of them that we just celebrated three years without a recordable injury within their workplace. Uh, three years without even a recordable. It's an amazing achievement, but they've really focused and done everything that we suggested to get those injuries out of the workplace. It is an achievable goal. You might need to get there in stair steps, so be careful, but the, the ultimate goal can be zero. Okay, I just wanna build a little bit of understanding for you that it's not an unachievable goal. When we talk about the law of navigation and casting a vision, it's got to be in alignment also with your corporate culture. If your corporate department heads and executive leadership won't set good purpose, vision, mission, and core value statements, you are going to have a hard time casting a vision from within. You do need to get them on the same page. There's some great work being done at the product specialty conferences each year especially over this last year, where we're engaging discussions with your corporate leadership on the value of safety and incorporating that into their purpose and vision and mission statements. The same discussion that I just had with you about the industry average rates I've actually had with many of your leaders that have attended those product conferences, and we've discussed the same thing there and tried to get them warmed up and ready for your discussion with them. Um, you, you do need to be engaging in this though. You need to build core values and mission, vision, and purpose. You know, here at Optimum, we have a vision statement that says workers everywhere valued and safe. One of the reasons I so appreciate the partnership we have with MSCI is I have an opportunity to live out my vision statement here for our corporation doing these webinars. All of what we're doing here today helps us to see workers everywhere valued and safe as those on this webinar begin to grasp this vision and transfer it into your organizations. We're here to help. It, it's a daunting task at times. We're here to help with question and answer. We're here to help with the safety helpline and other resources I'm gonna provide. We're here to help engage in further work uh, like we're doing with many of the members. Uh, just engage the discussion, right? And then as you do, you can actually use these um, these uh, core values and so on to guide the discussions with your teams. We see it play out even in safety leadership teams. Um, I had a meeting with a client the other day with their safety leadership team where one of the main leaders in the organization asked a question and brought it up as an issue amongst the leadership team. And when I asked him, how does, how, what would you find if you looked at your core values that might help you answer that question? We pulled the core values up on the screen off of their website. They were able to look at it. And within moments, that leader said, you know what? Got it. No longer an issue. That tells me exactly what I need to do. I don't need to waste the team's time. I've got it. 
it was such a compelling moment for this type of discussion. I, I can't encourage you more to get your corporate culture in alignment with where you want to go from a safety standpoint. It's an amazing thing when you see the light bulbs come on like that in a room. All right, investing in other leaders. Let's talk about John's law number 20. This is the law of explosive growth, and it's really the most exciting of all 21 of his laws as he lays them out. This is literally the multiplication effort of your leadership that goes beyond yourself and can actually set in motion a legacy of leadership that outlasts our own lifetimes. I, I know there are leaders around MSCI that are engaged in this work. It is difficult work leading their organizations. Um, you know, I, I, I want to I want to call out Bill Chisholm as one of those. Bill, I, I don't I'm not sure if you're on the line here with us today, but what an example of a leader who's doing the hard work within his organization to set a legacy like this in motion. Um, I just want Bill, if I could, I'd, I'd applaud you right now. It'd be a little obnoxious to everybody on the line, and uh, so I won't do that. But I just I'm really excited to have Bill's involvement. Um, within the MSCI board and within the safety leadership, uh, the uh, uh, safety committee for MSCI, setting a great example. But to add growth, you lead followers. To multiply, you lead leaders. Now, these are uh, principles of biblical proportion. I won't get into that here today, but um, th they are just principles that are outstanding and can leverage your work within your organization today uh, through lifetimes to follow. Literally what Law 20 tells us is that leaders who develop other leaders have some characteristics. Number one, they want to be succeeded. They want to work themselves out of their current job. Don't fall trapped to the same thoughts I had. I remember years ago saying to someone, well, if I develop other leaders, what am I going to do? I want to hold on to this role I'm in. That is a great way to stifle your own career, your own organization, you have to be willing to lift other leaders. You know, the quote here from John Kennedy, the rising tide lifts all boats. Just think about that. As the tide come in, comes in, all the boats get lifted. The same thing happens with leadership. It's a great visual for this, for this uh, principle. Leaders who develop other leaders know that they need to work with the top 20% of the organization not the bottom 20%. Don't work with the naysayers, don't worry about it. They'll come along or they'll self-select out or they'll end up getting terminated in their relationship with the organization because as you build the culture with the top 20, they will stand out like sore thumbs everywhere. They have to leave, they'll have to self-select out. So we've gotta quit focusing on them. We also need to focus on the strengths in the organization, not on the weaknesses. Build on your strengths, Find others that have the strengths that are missing and keep pouring into them. Great leaders also know that individuals get treated differently. You know, there's a lot of discussion about trophies for participation. Um, that doesn't work from a leadership standpoint. You give trophies to top performers. Everybody else gets an honorable mention, right? You give trophies out to people who really perform, and we want to celebrate that. I think. In much of our cultures, we've lost that. We really need to be treating individuals differently and understanding that those that perform get, get lifted and elevated and they'll draw the others with them. Invest time in others and then grow by multiplication. It's a great principle. Those that have experienced it, I know you're nodding your head affirmatively. You've seen this work in your organizations. It is just an amazing place to be. Now, I'd really be remiss if I didn't bring back the conference one more time, and I'm gonna hit on this once more and then I'll be done with it. If we're talking about the law of explosive growth, you've got a great resource for you to go and learn and be a leader. If you're already elevating yourself in leadership positions, it's time for you to pour into others. The best thing you could do for those leaders is to get them to the MSCI Safety Conference. So my question to you here is, not only are you coming, who are you bringing? MSCI has a buddy rate for those that you would bring. You need to take a look at it. It's right on the MSCI website, msci.org. Comes right up in the banner you see on the top. When you click on it, you'll see all the information on it. 
bring people with you. They will be forever changed and help you elevate safety within the organization. All right, some other considerations. You know, as I prepared for this webinar, I thought, how am I gonna cram all of this into 45 minutes? There's so much that I wanna try and convey. As we look at the rest of John's laws, the other 21 laws, and they're not even all represented here, can't get them all on the screen. A couple of things I wanna point out, the law of addition. John tells us that everything we do should be centered around adding value to people. If you continue to move forward from here, thinking about how can I add value to the people in my organization? How can I teach them what I know? How can I make them stronger as a leader in their area? How can I draw out of them the good that's there and help it be part of where the organization's going? You're adding value to people. That will serve you and your organization very well as you move forward. The law of solid ground, build trust with those that are following you. Work hard at that, protect it with all you have. Make sure that you're a valuable resource to them. And it doesn't mean you need to be perfect, but own your mistakes when you make them. The law of respect, build a track record of courage, standing in the gap, success, planning things and making sure that they work out well. And loyalty, making sure that you really care for the people that are caring for you. Those that have your back, do you have theirs? The law of the picture, law 13, set an example in your behavior of what you want. And I think one of Mother Teresa's most famous quotes was, be the change that you desire to see. It's like, what is it that we want to see? And then we should be exuding that example and making sure that, that we're living out an example for people to follow. And then the law of safety, uh, the law of victory, <laughs> the law of safety, it really is the law of victory, right? Be the champion for safety and win at it. Make sure at all costs that your people are cared for in your plant and be the champion for them in safety. These things are just great resources as you read through John's book. I just wanna really encourage you to study it. Lastly, I wanna make sure that you know about the resources that are available to you as you engage this conversation about safety. Make sure you're taking advantage of and utilizing these resources. So MSCI's partnership with the National Safety Council. So you know about the conference and the Congress that's coming up in September. You know about the advanced safety certificate. Make sure you're engaging in those and taking advantage of the resources, but also resources that are available through industry expert affiliate members like Optimum and several others. You know, we, we sponsor the safety helpline. Call us, we'd love to hear from you. We don't get very many calls on that helpline uh, ahead of problems. We get them after the fact. So give us a call and let's engage in some proactive discussion. Third party assessments that companies like ours offer and safety initiative planning. Come, the members that have taken advantage of that have really reaped a great benefit. We have case studies on it. Ask us about that. We can get those into your hands so you can engage in that discussion. We do have perception and engagement surveys that we're running now across MSCI members that can help you really understand how your workplace, how, how your workers and your supervisors and your managers align in perception and how engaged they are in safety. And then we'll begin to be able to gather data on how you compare to the other industry companies across the MSCI membership. Machine safeguarding assessments. It's very difficult to build a safety culture in an organization where you're telling your workers you care, but your machines are totally unguarded. And we see a lot of this. So we wanna make sure that you're understanding that that's available, engage in it, make sure that you're having discussions with somebody about it and get those assessments done. And then things like leadership and behavior-based safety training. All of those are offered through companies like ours, engage in those discussions and those process. Lastly, I wanna make sure you're aware of a resource that we're gonna be offering free to the webinar attendees today. You know, we have a great following on this webinar. It, it's a pleasure for me to present them and for our staff to present them. And, and I think that you've found value in them because the attendance typically maintains a steady level and there's repeat people coming back and, and listening to the content. Because of that, and because of the great resource in John's 21 Laws, what we did was we got on camera 
and I've recorded about a minute and a half to two minute long safety leadership topic on each and every one of the laws. So we've contextualized John's 21 laws for safety leadership. What we're doing within our uh, clients, our, our safety professionals here utilize these from our safety committees or safety leadership teams, the first couple of minutes of every one of those meetings, once a month, we play this video. The team has read the chapter in the book at the beginning of the month, and they've been looking for ways to see it and utilize it within the workplace. After the video is run, we have up to a 10 minute discussion around the room on how they've implemented that law within their workplace. It's tremendous the discussions and the results of that that are happening around member companies across the industry. I wanna make sure you know that next week we'll be emailing out to each of the webinar attendees access instructions with a code and an ability to get in and download the videos and run them uh, within your workplace. So look for that email next week. Please put these to use. We would love to hear stories and see comments about how they're influencing and impacting your organization. So Chris, at this point, I wanna turn the webinar back over to you. I'm not sure uh, where we're at from a question standpoint, but I certainly wanna make the remaining time available to answer any questions. Uh, while we're doing that, just to remind everybody of the free resources that are available that in the uh, handout area, including the top 10 most frequently cited, uh, which can help your organization do some self-critical analysis. So Chris, at this point, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thanks, Steve. We do have some questions, so I'm going to go through them more or less in the order that they came in. Um, the first one, um, I think, is a conundrum that a lot of people face in the metals industry. And I'm going to read it verbatim, which I don't normally do, but I think this is important. Um, so here we go. If there is absolutely nothing more important than the health and safety of our employees and those who we invite onto our work site, why does leadership use money as a constraint to address health and safety issues? Yeah, it's a great question. I've, I've really had to wrestle with this. Um, you know, working as a safety manager within a manufacturing facility for a good number of years and then consulting that same business over a 20 year history, um, you know, I, I, I battled with the same issue. I, one of the, the things I often joke about is that I have a thickened section of bone in the front of my forehead from slamming my head into the wall over and over again trying to get management to really understand why it is that we need to move things forward. The, the best thing that I can, I can uh, advise on this is what I've found works over and over and over again in these situations. Um, I've, I've heard safety professionals approach upper management and talk about compliance. Um, you know, quite frankly, upper management often doesn't give a rip about compliance. And, and I know there's there's companies on the phone right now or on the webinar that that just really ruffled their feathers because they really do care about being compliant. Um, we've had discussion recently about all of the different companies that are represented at MSCI. You know, the top 10% of the companies, they get this. They're living it. They're breathing it day in, day out. There isn't even a question. I'm sure that question didn't come from one of those members uh, personnel. At the bottom end, the bottom 10% you know, of the industry, those are small, very, uh, very small family held uh, businesses. Uh, they're not even MSCI members maybe. It's the 80% in the middle where we find a cross section <clears throat> of companies where this issue comes up. Um, quite often they are, um, old world founders, they've come over maybe from Europe, they've started the business in their garage, they've built it to a level of success, and now they're, they're really at a point where, you know, they've got a few hundred employees and they're behind the curve, and not only behind the curve in their safety development, system development, but also behind the curve in their own leadership development. Maybe they never attended a webinar like this back when they started, and they didn't understand that they needed to keep up with and ahead of the growth of their own organization. So compliance won't be a good motivator. We can't use that as a motivator. Um, some from a moral standpoint, 
you know, I, I hate to say it, but, you know, we've got companies out there and, and maybe even within the membership, I'm saying maybe trying to be kind, that, you know, there's just not a very high value of, of the human capital. The human life is just not uh, first and foremost. The, the profit center of the bottom line is what is first and foremost. And Chris, you've heard me speak on this at the product conferences. We've talked about the different motivators that hit the owners, the um, sales reps. You know, sales reps will be motivated for safety when they realize that public image of the company can be totally damaged and they can lose all of their clients when you have fatal injuries or OSHA taking you to task. So we, I, I think the, the real message that people on the line need to hear is communication of the message in a language that the hearer will understand is critically important. When we're talking to top level executives and CEOs, their entire world revolves around reporting to a board of directors or investors about profit and loss. And as hard as we'd like to kick against it and say, that's a terrible motivator to get people to understand they need to do something for safety. All too often with business professionals, it is a great starting point. If you can help that CEO understand how to put more money on the bottom line of the organization with a return on investment for safety, they will buy in almost every time. That's why we're so excited about getting them around guys like Bill and the other business leaders at the different conferences to make sure they hear from them uh, like we did at the annual. So don't be afraid of using dollars and cents for return on investment as safety motivators. Uh, we do it all the time marketing to companies to try to get them to engage in a process to build a safety management system because we know, like the National Safety Council studies show, that for every dollar invested in safety, you can return between three and five dollars back to the bottom line. Safety does generate an ROI or return on investment. Don't be afraid to use it. Uh, if not doing that would be the equivalent of going to Spain and trying to speak to Spanish speakers in German. It, it just doesn't happen. So anyway, I hope that helps to answer that question. I'd love to engage more discussion on that on the helpline if anyone has particular questions. Okay, that, that's uh, related to the second question. Uh, and you may have answered part of this next question, but okay. um, it's a little bit different situation. And, and um, I know that top executives are often motivated by profit and loss. That's just the way the world works. But there are intermediate levels of management that can be in between a safety professional and that very top executive. And even if that very top executive buys in, often a safety professional will encounter a situation where an intermediate, a middle manager, uh, someone between them and the top is resistant to implementing effective safety practices, to spending money on safety, um, resistant to the pull of making sure everybody's safe all the time, trying to get to zero incidents and accidents. How does someone best deal with that kind of situation as opposed to the situation that you just addressed in your answer to the last question? Yeah, perfect. It, it really dovetails well. Um, so just like I mentioned, you know, you're traveling to a foreign country, you've got the language that's spoken there. You need to either understand that language or bring a translator. So same issue here. If we're dealing with middle managers or production managers, uh, which I think is the audience, right? It's like, how do we get our production managers to buy in? Yes. So, you know, if we're talking to production managers, the question I would ask is, okay, when you're going to go to that country and have that conversation with that production manager, what language do they speak? And very often you'll find production managers are not um, spoken to about bottom line profits because they can't control it. What they're spoken to about is production numbers, how many units they have to get out that day in a quality, uh, how, many, um, yeah, how many units, how many feet, how many tons of steel they have to ship or produce. 
one of the ways that I found to do this is we, we had a um, uh, situation where the employer I worked at as their safety manager had uh, massive OSHA citations because of forklift issues. So we were working through trying to get better forklifts and decommission old junk and get them out of the workplace. And I finally got the owner of the business to buy us a brand new forklift. It was a $24,000 lift truck. About a month and a half into it, one of the guys that was operating it badly damaged it. And believe it or not, caused $24,000 worth of damage to this forklift. And I thought, this is insane. I've got to find a way to protect the equipment by having the guys make better choices when they're riding it or driving it or using it. And what I did was I went to our CFO and I asked him, translate for me, what's our bottom line profit percentage and how many dollars per square foot of product? We were actually producing precast wall panels, uh, precast concrete wall panels. And he was able to tell me how many dollars per square foot of profit. And then I was able to translate that back up into production rates. And what I did was I put out a bulletin the next week to the entire organization that said, this damaged forklift cost 24,000 to fix. How does that relate to you? And then I took pictures of the stacks and it was several rows in the yard of production that they had to do to make up that 24 grand to pay for that forklift repair. And what happened was we translated the dollars into the blood, sweat and tears that they do every day to produce the product and it worked like a charm. In fact, it worked so well the next week we had to put out a bulletin on workplace violence because they all wanted to kill the guy that damaged the forklift because they realized and internalized really what the work effort was. So. I, I hope that helps. It's just you got to know the language of the people and translate it into the language that they're incented on or measured on. Yeah, that that does help, actually. Thank you. So it's all about um, what are people going to listen to and understanding what that is, what those exactly. levers are to pull. Exactly. OK, I, I, we are um, almost exactly at 12 o'clock central, which means we need to end the webinar pretty quickly here. Um, Steve, I want to thank you for doing this again. And I wanna remind folks that we'll be doing another webinar um, within the next three months. So please stay tuned. You'll receive uh, email notification of that next webinar. Uh, please, as Steve has mentioned at least twice now, register for the MSCI Safety Conference in Indianapolis on September 27th and 28th. Um, there's just a lot of good that can come from attending that conference. And as Steve said, you can attend in teams and get some discounts because you're bringing other people along with you. So uh, I want to thank everybody for being on the line. If you do have any questions, as you see on the next slide that we've put up um, for you here, please call the safety helpline. Um, that's where you can get in touch with Steve and his staff, and they can get you answers to pretty much any question you might have about safety, safety leadership, and the aspects of your safety program that you might be struggling with. So thanks, everyone. Want you to have a good weekend, and we'll be back online talking to you soon.